It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. Welcome in to Take Command. I'm Craig Hoffman. That is Logan Paulson. And Logan, it is time for the final Logan Paulson Bowl of the season. San Francisco, <laughs> the last team that you played for. All five of your NFL teams on this on the schedule yeah. this year. Uh, this is this is the last one. And it's it's in some ways the most meaningful one. Um, you know, yeah. we talk about Kyle Shanahan a lot on this podcast because he was so instrumental uh, to your career, uh, a guy that you have so much respect for and learned so much football from. And so uh, we will get into the San Francisco offense versus the Washington defense and the Washington uh, offense versus this very, very good San Francisco defense coming up, our usual preview type of stuff. But I want to spend a few minutes here off the top of the podcast uh, talking about Kyle and, and your relationship with him and some of the kind of fundamental things that that you learn from him. Because I think you have a, re- a really special relationship with him. Like you were a guy that he could talk his highest level of football to. Um, and it's something that we've talked about, like, wasn't the case with every player uh and and sometimes that actually earlier in his career especially got Kyle in trouble uh it was mm-hmm. he would he would put too much on guys um and so I, I'm just curious like when the first time you know you were aware of Kyle first time you met him and, and what your initial impressions were and how that relationship grew over the years yeah I mean I don't want to say that he could talk his highest level of football with me because he talks football you know at the highest level I mean he's like I don't want to say he's one of one but he's probably one of like five guys in the entire world that can talk football at that level. You're talking like him, Andy Reid, maybe Sean McVay, you know, uh, Mike McDaniel, which is crazy to think about that. They all kind of stem from the same tree. Um, You know, I've never met Kevin personally. I met him like at my son's football game once, but you know him better. Maybe he could be in that pantheon of people, but yeah, very, very smart dude. And um, I just, one of my most vivid memories of him is the first install I ever did where he sat down and we were kind of going over like day one install. It was in training camp or OTAs maybe. And he just kind of, I remember him meticulously going over every aspect of the defense, of our defense, right? Kind of saying, this is how they run their cover two. This is how they run their cover three. Out of a three by one, they're going to match. The middle linebacker is going to match like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it just, and it, I just remember thinking like, he's like, man, he really studied this defense a lot this off season to kind of get us ready. And then week one, it was the same thing. His understanding and his like attention to detail every single week for the opponent was just on another level. And like the way he studied and he kind of just grinded the tape to find and basically teach himself a defense in a week, it just was unparalleled. You know, he had a lot of resources and a lot of smart people around him. So I don't want to say it's all him, but just that level of kind of obsession about it was um, was really cool. And then like you didn't, you know, because he was the first OC that I ever had. And so going from him and then going to Sean, you're kind of like, oh, all OCs are like this, <laughs> right? And then right. you go to some other places and you're like, that's actually not true. You know, like, and and I, I just, again, it just enhanced my level of respect for him. And then to see him again, kind of like take a little hiatus and then see him again in San Francisco, that was really cool too, because it was like, <clears throat> excuse me, it was like to see him grow up and the way he communicated with the team. Uh, was was fantastic and then again how he had just continued to mature in a football understanding was 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 just fantastic so you know like he's the reason like you know when I'm talking offensive football in a lot of ways like I look at it in a very specific way and he's the reason like undoubtedly he's the reason I look at it that way um I don't I was actually talking about this on the show yesterday or on uh on Wednesday and we were talking about how Wink Martindale uh, is really talented at at what he does. And part of the reason why is he like really understands protections offensively. Mm. And there's just not a lot of coaches like the coaches understand on a baseline level what's happening. But the level of detail that like a Wink Martindale does to be able to truly manipulate the rules of a protection to to generate pressure. Because I was talking actually it wasn't even on the show. It was before the show. I was talking with Anthony. Um, mm-hmm. You know, for those that don't listen to the Hoffman show regularly, first of all, shame on you. Second of all, uh, Anthony Haney, my producer. And, uh, he's like, I was like, they blitzed a lot. And he's like, actually they didn't blitz a lot. Like, I'm like, you're right. But they create a lot of pressure because Wink Martindale is, is an excellent pressure creator. Long story short and how it relates to Kyle is like if Wink Martindale had to design protections and had to like all of a sudden fill in as an O-line coach one week, it feels like he could do it because he yeah. actually has that level of understanding. And there, that is actually pretty rare 
that a coach has that level of understanding of the other side of the ball. And it's interesting listening to you talk about this. Like, I actually wonder how good, good of a defensive coordinator Kyle could be <laughs> because he just has that next level understanding. So I, I guess in question form, like how common is that, that someone truly is an expert kind of in both sides of the ball, even if they apply their skills on one? It's very rare. You know, I think um, obviously there's a couple guys like Raheem Morris is a guy yeah. who's been able to kind of consistently switch sides of the ball. He's been a head coach. Very, very smart guy. And I think the, the best coaches that I've been exposed to, um, they really understand defenses. You know, uh, Frank Smith, the uh, OC in Miami now, was the tight end coach when I was in Chicago. And he was a guy that was like, when he coached O-line, he was meticulous about studying defensive line techniques. Like he was obsessive about it obsessive about understanding pressure packages. And that's why he's kind of gone on this ascension is now an OC, right? He's gone from a tight end coach to an OC. And I think that is, um, again, like that is what it takes to be a really good coach in the NFL. And the person that I guess exemplifies that the most um, is Kyle. I mean, uh, Mike is excellent at that also. Mike McDaniel does a fantastic job with that. Um, and But that's, again, I think they've kind of learned that from each other, you know? And that's one of the reasons why everyone says, why is Kyle's coaching tree so successful? And it's because they have this, this compulsion about the details and about finding edges and putting your guys in the best position to be successful. Like I watched, you know, the Seattle game and like, there were so many like Kyle specific calls in that game. And what I mean by that is like, Kyle's going to run outside zone. He's going to run keepers. He's going to run play pass. He's going to keep the O line out of drop back passing situations as much as possible. And then he's going to find four to five plays in a game where you just are not ready defensively. And they just shatter every single rule that you have. Right there's a touchdown. Uh, Kittle's second touchdown in the game is um, it's out of a uh, 21 personnel. They've got a use check in the backfield. They've got McCaffrey in the backfield. They run both of them to the left, and they've got the receiver and Kittle to the left also. So they've essentially made a four by one receiving surface for the defense. And you can just tell the will linebacker. You know, I was talking to Ron about this. Is supposed to match the corner, but because you rarely see four by ones and you rarely see someone get to a four by one post snap that way. Uh, the linebacker doesn't know what to do, and Kittle's wide open and runs for a touchdown. Obviously, Kittle does a lot of that work on his own in terms of making the safety miss, but in terms of creating a throw where the maybe the best receiving tight end in the NFL is open with no one within 20 yards of him, like that's Kyle. George's first touchdown is composed in a very similar way, right? McCaffrey has a, a huge long catch against the Miami Dolphins. Again, the composition is very similar in terms of game planning, breaking rules, challenging uh, the defense, right? So that's where Kyle is just excellent, right? You know, and I and I think, um, yeah, he's he's grown up in a football family, and football is very very important to him, and it shows up in terms of his preparation. And he is he is very unique, and I'm I count myself very very blessed to have learned from him, and you know, learning even just a fraction of his knowledge is 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 a really cool was was really special. How did his communication skills grow over the years? Yeah. That was kind of the criticism of him as a younger coach. It was like he was pretty gruff, uh, kind of hard yeah. to, to get along with sometimes because he had such a high standard. And, you know, that is that is sometimes the torture of genius. And we've seen yeah. it. Um, you know, Michael Jordan famously was this way where he just, like, didn't understand why other people wouldn't put in the work that he did right. and couldn't do what he did. And it's like, well, I, I would just do this. Why why can't you do that? And it's like, because I'm not Michael Jordan. Like, mm. you are. Um, so how and, – and I think it's interesting you mentioned and how uh, there was kind of that distinctive leap that you mm -hmm. took a hiatus from him, aka you went somewhere else. Um, you know, Kyle ultimately brings you back uh, when he gets to San Francisco. So, like, how did his communication grow over the years, and how do you think that's helped him be an effective head coach where he's now headed to the playoffs again? Well, like, there was this, you know, obviously I was a young player, so my relationship to the staff is going to be different than when I'm in year seven, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. Yeah. But I think the thing that stuck out to me was like he was so in his own head early on. Like you'd walk by him in the hallway and he wouldn't he wouldn't even acknowledge you. You know what I mean? Like he was just like he was just thinking about I, I felt like he was thinking about football every time I saw him, you know, and he wouldn't and he wouldn't eat. He wouldn't go down to the team meals like he was he was obsessively. He was always in his office <clears throat> watching film. And I think when I saw him, you know, in year seven, when he was in San Francisco, his first year in San Francisco, like he understood he kind of had grown and understood the importance of the, the relationship side of it a little bit more. Right. He understood like, Hey, you know what, what's up, Logan, how's your family or what's going on? And you know, that was a little bit outside of his comfort zone, but you could tell like, that's something Sean always had Sean McVay. Yeah. He was Sean's always very, super personal on that stuff. Always very like remembers everybody's name. And that was something Kyle had to like work at and work on. 
And, uh, you know, it was just cool to see that development, you know, and it kind of inspires you as a player to say, like, always, always be growing, like always have that student mindset. And that was something that he struggled with. And the way he kind of coped with it, I remember talking to him about it. I said, like, you know, what, like, what's the change? He's like, well, I knew I was going to have a hard time with it in the beginning. Um, so I, 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 every, and he, and I'm remembering back, like, this is true. Every team meeting, he's like, I always centered it around film, which is something that I was really comfortable talking about. So I would kind of step back and let the film tell my story. And I remember <clears throat> defensive guys sitting in the meeting with their mouths like gaping, just amazed at how how he knew the defenses, how he knew the rules, how he knew all this stuff. And again, that endears you to that population. And as he got more comfortable, he became that guy who could stand at the podium and be like, hey, you know, this is what we're doing this week and kind of embody what his dad was so good at as a head coach. So um, yeah, that, that was really cool, man. It was just, um, it, it's cool to see people grow. You know, it's cool to see people change, player, coach, whatever. And, um, you know, I've just been very fortunate to see, you know, not only Kyle, but Sean and Matt LaFleur is another one, you know, Dan, Mike McDaniels, uh, Frank Smith is another guy we just talked about, um, who just have matured and what it takes to go from a good coach, a good position coach to a coordinator, to a head coach. And that maturation has just been fantastic. And, um, you know, Kyle to me is a, just showed a different path to kind of get to that head coaching position. Uh, how do you think he's matured from like a football standpoint? Mm -hmm. What What is the thing that that's different maybe now about what he does with the game plan versus what he did, uh, you know, earlier in his career? So I think there was a little bit of like, uh, there was like a dogmatic approach to like the outside zone keeper play action pass off of outside zone stuff that they did. Like, that's like what we did. That's what you did. That's what we died by. That was our sword. And, um, and we were good at it. And there, there's, a, there's merit there. And then now I think when you look at what they do offensively, there's a lot more gap scheme stuff, a lot more kind of counter duo they run quite a bit, which is something he was vehemently opposed to um, when I was playing with him my first stint in, uh, in, in Washington, obviously. And so that maturation, I think um, he just – I think the other thing that he's been really cool about is just understanding – positionless football kind of you know you're a big basketball guy understanding like yeah. that getting guys that can do like getting a running back in christian mccaffrey everyone's like why are you giving up so much draft capital and i was one of those people but then you see what he does for the offense and he just like he can play you cannot match him the same way you can match a back you got to match him like a receiver kyle use is a tight end receiver you know fullback hybrid position right that can beat a linebacker one-on-one -on -one, can beat a safety one-on-one -on -one, right and so understanding the flexibility that gives you and then being able to kind of express that position flexibility. Debo Samuels is another guy that does an excellent job of that. You just say to yourself like, dang, even their uh, kind of third string receiver Jennings, they use him at times like they would use a tight end. And he's a big receiver. He's 6'3", 215-ish, 220 pounds. But, you know, getting the right kind of guy that lets you say, hey, as a receiver, you're going to crack a defensive end. You're going to crack a linebacker. You're going to be in our run front and having a receiver that's smart enough to do that. That's coaching, but that's also understanding the way football is going, you know, the way that they, he, he thinks football is going and the way it allows his offense to develop. So that again has been cool because, you know, you, to go, to go from a guy who kind of says like, this is the only thing that we need to do to now someone who says, Oh no, we can incorporate this and and knowing when to throw certain pitches and knowing when to throw certain punches, I think has been a really cool maturation to watch from him. Uh, last thing I want to circle back to that when we get into our like more sure. specific offensive preview and the idea of scheme versus personnel. Um, and the fact that Kyle, who may be the best schemer in the entire NFL is like, yeah, you know what makes my scheme work better? Really good football players like Christian McCaffrey. Um, but wrapping up the Logan Kyle tales. Your favorite Kyle Shanahan story that you can tell on a podcast without getting either of you in trouble. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's any like. I, so, and I, I hope you'd be okay with me telling this. Like, so he's a guy that, and this is a story. This is going to sound like a bad story, but this is the thing that I absolutely respect most about him. He was so obsessed about football, he'd lose 15 or 20 pounds in a season. Like he would forget to eat. That's how important it was to him. You know. And I just thought to myself, like, golly, like, do you want to be great at something? Like, you have to prioritize that 1,000%. And so people ask me, like, you know, why didn't I get into coaching? That's something we talked about before on the show. Yeah. And 
I don't want to coach <clears throat> unless I can coach like Kyle Shanahan, a guy that just says this is the most important thing. This is like almost more important than living is is this. And that is a to find somebody and see someone with that type of passion and motivation and obsession is uh, is cool. And that's something that I always have a ton of respect for him about. Yes, but also official stance of the Take Command podcast. Please eat. <laughs> Please eat. Kyle, yeah, Kyle, Kyle eat. and everybody else. <laughs> yeah, to eat your food. I'm not saying, but I, but I'm saying like, and he and but, he knows that. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, and he, it's something I think he's actually talked about. Uh, yeah, and so where, like, but like he's had to he's had to become a little less obsessive to balance family and to balance his 100%. own health and and you know that's that's a challenge though when you have that obsessive personality like he does and you're so good at it too because you know like you know it, it's it's hard because when you've spent the extra time and it's paid off you yeah. want to continue to spend the extra time but you also know in the long term it's only so sustainable right. and um it's something it's, that it's he's, like, it's like he's that, continued it's like, to find balance in it's like that warrior mentality it's like if you went all in on something gave right. every ounce of yourself to something like what's the result and i think right. like everyone talks about doing that everyone talks about it but no one actually does like even when i was playing i was pretty crazy but there was always a little bit of me left right that wasn't totally committed to football right there was always a little bit of space and i feel like kyle's one of those guys who's like no like let's just go for it and like that's something that is in space yeah that we're like this is it this it's football and football or bust so that's something that i think is uh that i've always respected about him and a lot of people might think that's a weird story but i, I mean like i have a lot of respect for that like as someone who's just totally dialed in and like weaponized their mind towards a task yeah uh that, that's a great way to put it Wep weaponize the mind um and it is Certainly done a lot of damage uh, to NFL <laughs> <laughs> NFL teams uh, this season. Uh, Take a man podcast from Odyssey Sports. That's Logan Paulson. I am Craig Hoffman. Uh, you can catch me on the Hoffman Show, 3 to 6, each and every weekday on the Team 980. Then Logan and I come together for a countdown to kickoff on 106.7 The Fan and the Team 980. Three hours prior to kickoff most weekends, although I think we're 2 to 4 what is it 425 kick so we start at two uh on on saturday on christmas eve for this particular game all right so the san francisco offense was pretty good to start the year um and then and then uh they got christian mccaffrey uh mm -hmm. the first game they played with mccaffrey they lost to kansas city 44 23 he was barely there um he only had eight rushing attempts in the game had a couple of uh, two receiving targets he had been there for like two days then they played the Rams, Chargers, uh, Cardinals, Saints, Dolphins, Bucks, and Seahawks, and they won every single one of those games. McCaffrey has been an absolute monster. Last two games, he's been over 100 yards rushing. He's had, you know, against Miami, an 80-yard receiving game, another 67-yard receiving game against Arizona. Like, and I was listening to Kimes' podcast uh, a little bit earlier today, and he had Nick Wagner, uh, his buddy, who's a great reporter who covers uh, the 49ers for ESPN, and he said that the 49ers' offense has been averaging eight more points per game since McCaffrey got there. What has Christian McCaffrey brought to this Niners offense that was already so dangerous and, and has just vaulted it to another level, even with Mr. Irrelevant Brock Purdy playing quarterback these last couple of weeks? Yeah, I, yeah. so I think the thing that he just – it's it's another weapon for Kyle to utilize. And it's one of the most elite weapons at the position. You're going to be hard pressed to find a more dynamic receiving running back. So that, that gives you opportunity as a runner for him to be elite. But I think where he really separates himself is as a passer, what he can do on third down, what he can do from a mismatch standpoint. I mentioned the, the, the deep go ball that he catches against Miami. He catches a fade um, in another game. I forget which one it was, but you know, just the ability to have a guy with that receiving acumen, that level of quickness, that level of understanding of coverage that is listed as a running back, that the defense matches as a running back. Like I was having a conversation with someone in the building of the day, and it's like everyone thinks you got to match him like a running back. You got to match him like a wide receiver, which was a crazy mm -hmm. thing to think about. But that's exactly what you're getting out of Christian McCaffrey and what he brings in the skill set and the way Kyle utilizes him. He might line up in the backfield, but you have to account for him like that elite kind of receiver. So, um, yeah, I think that's what he does. He just he, he lets you steal possessions, lets you gain possessions. He finds explosive plays a lot of a lot of the times through scheme, but also through understanding like you need a guy who can run a good choice route. Christian McCaffrey's elite at that. And Kyle Shanahan's offense, a lot of what they do on third down, not a lot. I'd say probably 30 to 40 percent. So a fair chunk 
relies on people winning in one-on-one situations. And you've got a guy who can do that consistently. Right. And um, that's the same thing with Kyle Juszczyk and, um, you know, Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle. And you just add another piece in there. And so think about that when Debo Samuel's healthy, that's got to be one of the best skill position players in the NFL. Oh, it's, it's absolutely filthy. Um, the, the collection, I mean, the collection they have right now without Debo, nevertheless, what happens when they get Debo back? Um, it, it's really remarkable what they've done. And, and again, like, you know, to circle back to the point we, we touched on a little bit in the opening segment, like the fact that Kyle isn't just like, eh, give me whoever, like yeah. the fact that Kyle is like, give me the best. And then mm-hmm. I'm going to make us unstoppable. Like that is a credit to Kyle because of the, um, because of like the, I don't want to say humility, but like the, the understanding, right? It's, it's, it's a lack of arrogance, even if you don't want to go all the way to humility. Um, but I guess it is kind of one and the same there to say we are better when we have these guys and we're not just going to rely on the fact that we can scheme people open because yeah, can you scheme people open a couple times a game if you're a really good OC? Yeah, I saw it. I mean, when I was covering Jay's offense uh, and some of those really lean years at receiver, they could get a high cross open three times a game like mm-hmm. clockwork. Yeah, but they didn't have a guy when Jamison Crowder and Jordan Reed weren't healthy that could slip a tackle and pick up twenty yards on your on your basic play. And when you have a Christian McCaffrey who can score from anywhere, and a Debo Samuel, and a Brandon Ayuk who is a th- threat to score on every play and Kittle and all these dudes mm-hmm. it's it you don't have to be great because there's just going to be plays that are designed to kind of move the chains and, and get you some yardage and then there's going to be your shots and if you can accidentally quote unquote score on your down in down out football um that elevates your offense to a completely new new level and that kind of feels like where San Francisco is and it allows them to if they don't have big plays on accident if you will at the very least, move the ball to the areas of the field where they can then dial up those shots and become really effective. And you get your, you know, George Kittle gets lost and is somehow wide open in the middle of the field, uh, even though he's the best tight end in football, and every eye should be on him. You get those plays in the right areas of the field, and that's how they consistently score. Yeah, and I think your your hypothesis, your thesis there about good football players or Kyle's thesis, I think is hashed out everywhere on every team this year look at the philadelphia eagles with the addition of aj brown look at the miami dolphins with the addition of tyree kill when you get dynamic playmakers it makes your offense more dynamic i mean even look here in washington look at how much different this offense looks when jahan's playing well right and i think that that's something that um you know a lot of people want to say oh it's the coach but it it's you know everyone says it's the uh it's the jimmies and joes not the x's and o's and that's true if you've got studs and you've got good ball players Look at the L.A. Rams right now. Look what happens when their Cooper Cup gets hurt. Their offensive line kind of deteriorates. They just don't have the Joes. Kyle or Sean could be the, the smartest guy in the whole world, and he's very, very smart. But you can't scheme – you can't out-scheme a, a, a super deficient roster. And I think I think Kyle's aware of that. I think Mike McDaniel's aware of that. Shoot, I even think uh, Kevin O'Connell's aware of that, right? They have an outstanding yeah. receiving Hey, let's there. throw to Justin Jefferson seven billion times in a season. Right. And um, so, yeah, I think uh, I think that's that's uh, that's very astute. And I think it's the direction that everyone in the league is trying to trend, not just the really smart guys. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, what makes like Scott Turner also understands this. The, yeah. the difference between Scott Turner and Kyle Shanahan in this regard is the discipline. Like mm-hmm. Kyle is going and, and, you know, Kevin is like this, like. Every single game, basically, Justin Jefferson. I think there was one where he had like three or four targets. But almost every single game, Justin Jefferson has 10, 11 targets. Uh, Christian McCaffrey is going to get his touch. He's going to get 20 touches in a game. Like that, the, there's no game plan that exists unless, and this is something that's worth talking about, they, you know, pull back because they've already clinched the division. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they're trying to win a game all out, Christian McCaffrey is getting 25 probably touches like in the playoffs McCaffrey's going to get 25 to 30 touches mm-hmm. and it seems like that's Scott not, gets that's a not bit, running that's not running the ball that's right more as a, t- I touches think, yeah. right mm-hmm. you know let's say 18 carries and seven targets right we'll get 25 opportunities maybe is even a better word yeah um and it feels like Scott has gotten lost a couple times this year um in some of that and also I think the thing that that is a differentiator is like a guy like Kyle will run his stuff. He's not going to try to get too cute. 
Um, something, though, that he did as a younger uh, play caller, I think, at times. Had, had too much on players' plates. Tried to do a little bit too much. Um, and that's something that we've talked about with Scott is he's still evolving and is, relatively speaking, a young play caller. Um, but specific to the San Francisco team, like, what are you nervous about knowing how Kyle thinks if you're Ron and Jack of where they're going to attack this week and, and what are some of the ways in which you're trying to load up to stop it? Um, and by the way, um, we just have this breaking news as we're recording. You'll love this breaking news so your podcast isn't instantly dated. But Chase Young is going to play this week. Um, mm. So Rivera, Ron Rivera announced Chase Young is in against the 49ers. Um, so you can you can wrap that into your answer if it's somewhat relevant. Right. So I think one of the things when I watch the offense with Brock Purdy at the helm, I think people see these big point totals and they think, oh, he must be slinging it over the yard. They do a good job of insulating him. They run the football, play action, um, you know, keeper game stuff. Very similar, and you know, when you squint and look at it, kind of to to the New York Giants, they they they're trying to make it easier for Brock Purdy to be successful, and that's where like the game plan specific targets come in, where they've cultivated this look, and they say, Brock, the ball needs to go here, it will go here, we'll get it called versus the right coverage, we'll give you a check if it's not up, and. That's how they've been executing. And so I think people think of San Francisco as one of the most dynamic offenses in the NFL. At least that's what I thought coming in. And it is with Brock Purdy at the helm, they've shifted a little bit. The focus has shifted. They're trying to protect the the, the young signal caller, Mr. I know everyone's heard that storyline. They're trying to keep him insulated as much as they can. So as a result, there's not this kind of super dynamic vertical element like you would get against Kansas City. Are they awesome? Yes. Are they much different team without Debo Samuel in the game? Yes. And so the focus, I think, shifts to Christian McCaffrey and George Kittle. And historically, this team has done really well matching up with both of those positions, running backs and tight ends. And when you think about uh, Christian McCaffrey in Carolina last year, Cam Curl did an excellent job matching up with him. The problem, I think, with this defense and this offensive structure right now is that you – if Benjamin St. Juice back, comes back, that's a big deal because I think he basically erases Brandon Ayuk. I think Brandon Ayuk is a good football player. I don't think he's a game-changing football player in the sense he's that he's a hell of a third or fourth option. You know, yeah, probably when even like Samuel, he's, Samuel, and McCaffrey and Kittle are all available. Like he's he's their fourth best offensive yeah. weapon, which is gross. But like, if he's number one wide receiver, not your traditional number one. Correct. Like with him and Debo, scary. Him as the number one, and then Jennings is their number two. It's kind of like, okay, you, you know, it, it feels very. I don't want to say New York because that's a bad group, but it's kind of that. It's just it doesn't. The teeth are a little bit less sharp. Mm -hmm. So the the thing that I think becomes interesting is that how do you match up? You can't have Cam Curl on McCaffrey and on well, George and, and real quick, Cam Curl didn't. We're taping this on Thursday. Cam Curl didn't practice today. Um, so that's a he's, huge and deal. He's had an ankle thing, huge so deal. there's a chance there's no Cam Curl. Period, which would be disastrous. Not want to say disastrous, but it'd be it'd be bad, real be, real bad. Disastrous is a good word because who? Okay, it'll be up, disastrous because who matches up with people, right? And Cam's shown yeah. an ability to do that. And, you know, if I was kind of going through the checklist, I'd say Cam Curl matches up with Christian McCaffrey because he's your number one. Maybe Defoe has elements of that. Jamin, I think Jamin physically can do it, but obviously there's been times where he has kind of mental lapses in coverage. And then all of a sudden take Cam Curl out of that and say Defoe's matched up with Christian McCaffrey and Jamin Davis is matched up with George Kittle. I think both of those matchups favor San Francisco. So to me, that's a huge right. storyline. Can you defensively, stop because I think this is really what they want to be. They want to run the football to set up play action pass, set up the keeper game. And then they want to work in these kind of specific play calls to get the ball to Christian, to get the ball to Kittle. Right. And maybe one or two to Ayuk, but it's really the first two guys that I mentioned. So can you stop the run against this team is a huge element because so much of what they do is built off of that. And then if you can stop the run, I don't think Brock Purdy can beat you on a down to down basis. He can beat you on these, game plan specific calls but if you're saying Brock Purdy get back there and let's read this defense and let's go execute he has in the three games he's played has not shown an ability to do that and in fact he does put the ball in harm's way more than I was expecting a little little Taylor Heineke-esque on the turnover worthy plays dude 100 percent. and so I look at this and I say initially I thought this game was going to be totally out of reach and now this is going to be a tough game but I think this defense has shown an ability to stop the run I assume they'll be motivated. 
And if they can stop the run and force Brock Purdy to say, to beat you on a down to down basis, as opposed to kind of giving him these easy layup game plan throws that are glorified screens and glorified handoffs where he's not reading anything and just getting the ball to the best player on the field. This looks a little bit different. And I think this is the best defense that the 49ers have played in the last probably four or five. So again, those are things that I think are relevant and I think might change the complexion of this game. And I think we haven't talked about the offense yet, but I think there's a a, a path that the offense has success against the number one defense in the NFL. All right, well, let's, let's get into that. (laughs) Okay. So, um, so when you watch the San Francisco 49ers defense, it is dynamic as heck. They are ripping to the football. All three of their linebackers are like converted safety type body types. Those kind of like overhang, uh, field players that you get in college football. They're fast. They're physical. They attack the football. The defensive line is constructed much, much the same way. Nick Bosa is obviously a savage when it comes to rushing the passer. Eric Armstead's healthy. Uh, Kinlaw just got activated. I don't think he'll play. Um, uh, they have a backup defensive end, number 94, who I played with in Houston, who's very, very talented as a pass rusher. They're all, all their guys. I've, I've passed juice inside. They've got some dynamic play from that young safety from uh, Utah, who's been pretty good for them. So <clears throat> all those guys, very dynamic, very fast, run to the football like a bunch of lunatics. And talk about the Jimmys and Joes ex- elevating the X's and O's. I think that's a really good example. I think D'Amico Ryans does a good job of putting those guys in good positions to be successful. But it's really they've, – they've got some playmakers over there that, that run and hit – and are fast and love football and are smart football players. However, that being said, giving them their flowers, when teams, specifically Kansas City and Atlanta, when they run right at you, downhill, attack you as a running, they don't do as well with that. They are not like super physical. They don't have a Jordan Davis. They don't have a guy who's just kind of in there. They don't have a John Ridgway. They don't have a guy that's going to kind of say my job is to eat up space and destroy the run game they don't have that so you have seen a couple teams kansas city was surprising to me just run right at the teeth of that defense and they just did not have a good answer for it and so i look at what washington does really really well and what is it it's run right at you it's like pretty much like you know those slap contests that you see on on, you have you seen you familiar with those craig like yeah, when, people hold the when they decide to activate ESPN, the Ocho, like three yes. times a year. <laughs> yes. We're, yeah, the, people are just slapping each other in the face. Like, that's the game that Washington, that Washington <laughs> wants. Yeah. And that's the game I think the 49ers, at least from the games I've watched, have struggled with the most. Like, if you want to be cute and get lateral and try to get into space, they are going to hunt you down like a pack of wolves. But if you, if you run at them, they struggle a little bit. Now, I have one reservation about this game plan in, in – is that San Francisco knows that they know what our punch is. So what are they going to do? And then what's Scott's phase two going to be? Because Kansas city, they attacked him, like I said, but then they ran a couple jet sweeps sweeps off of that downhill action that went for big plays. They ran a couple play action shots in addition to all the stuff that Kansas city does really well. So it's phase one is, is there like, that's what you should be doing. Phase two is the stuff where you got to be playing chess with D'Amico Ryan's. So I anticipate them running the ball a borderline absurd amount this weekend because I do not think Ron Rivera will take anything else. Like mm. it was, it was almost painful listening to Ron at the podium this week because it was pretty clear based off of what he's saying into the microphone that he wasn't happy with the offensive game plan last week. And I'm just like, you're the head coach, man. Like at some point, can you not get on the headset? I mean, it seems like it happened to a point at halftime where yeah. it was like, Scott, come here. You remember who we are? Cool. Go do that. Go get him, partner. Like, and and it just, I don't understand how they got to, you know, 820 last Sunday night against New York with that game plan without Ron going like, hey, actually, let's not. Like, Mm. actually, can we do the thing that has gotten us back in playoff contention that helped us win six of seven games that helped us win, you know, six of eight with the tie. Like can, and if, if we could do just a little bit more, probably would have won the giants game. Like, can we do all of those things? And they go out and they lose 20 to 12 because they, they blow the game in the first quarter kind of. Um, and so I would imagine there is a directive from the largest <laughs> office uh, on the football side of the building 
to the offensive coordinator this week that says, be who we are, please, for the love of all things holy, whatever mm-hmm. deity it is that you believe in, run the football. Yeah. Um, and, and then it gets to that phase two. And then it gets to like, okay, that is what the basis of our offense is going to be. Hopefully then phase two kind of falls into place yeah. and you get back to some of the things that have been really effective for them. Uh, some of those jet sweeps off of duo action, if they're going to run them as opposed to trying to pull guys all over the place and do things that they're not good at and they haven't repped. Uh, hopefully the, the play action off of duo can get the chunk yardage to Terry McLaurin and to Curtis Samuel and Jahan Dotson. Um, maybe if we're lucky, the tight ends will even get involved this week, but let's not hold our breath. Maybe that's phase three. But if you can get phase one and phase two, the other thing that does is eat clock. And it, and it puts a little bit more pressure on Purdy in that offense and a little more urgency because you're not just getting the ball back quickly, going out there, taking your time, scoring. Like Each possession becomes a little bit more precious, and maybe that forces Purdy into a mistake. Or it, or it magnifies, right? Like if Purdy happens to throw you one, it makes it that much more important because there's a, a premium on each play, on each possession, because there's less of them to be had. So I think in all accounts, like that makes a lot of sense. Um, it also seems like the only viable option because if you try to get crazy against this team, like you're not as talented as they are, they're going to beat the tar out of you. Uh, and you also don't want to expose Heineke, um, which also, by the way, is something we should quickly talk about. Then I want to spend the last segment of the show quickly, um, a little bit more on Chase, and then uh, I want to talk about the Pro Bowl guys as well, um, the years okay. that they've had. Um, but to kind of wrap up this centralized preview portion, like – how short do we actually think the leash is? And like, if they're, they've only scored three points at halftime, are we talking about what this game plan looks like with Carson Wentz as opposed to Taylor Heineke? Cause I very much like personally listening to Ron, I think that's where we're at. And I actually think that if Taylor hadn't scored on the opening drive of the second half last week, we would have seen Carson last week. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I don't think uh, I would be reluctant to put Carson in this week at all, just because I think this defense eats quarterbacks like Carson. So I think yeah. you, I'm I think, not saying it's the right move. I'm saying right. that's, you know, that's what the head coach seems to think. I definitely think that that is on the radar and that is going to happen soon. And so like if Taylor comes out and struggles versus the 49ers, I guarantee you see him versus Cleveland because Cleveland's defense is not as good. And you kind of want in some way to validate the decision of bringing him in. And that would be the best way to do it. In my opinion is to kind of say, Taylor, sorry, like this defense is really good. Good luck. Have fun out there. You know, <laughs> Run around. Now, we need some of your magic. Yeah, and then now against Cleveland, let's get you out here. Uh, and real quick, so real quick before we kind of d- d- dig into that a little bit more, the other thing I wanted to kind of b- pin down there is, you know, you said they're going to run the football. I really hope there's not an overcorrection. I, th- I want them to correct back to where they were. But I right. also think you see some stuff in the second half of that game. You say, that makes this offense so much more dangerous. This kind of willingness to do the the boots, the play action, some of that stuff, and just come to it more quickly in your play calling uh, sphere is really advantageous because it also opens up the run game. So I don't want I don't want it to be forty five runs, right? I want it to be twenty five, you know, whatever that whatever that tipping point is where they can be most effective. But I'm worried that it's going to be like we got to run the ball. Let's go crazy. Let's go back to what we, you right. know, and I, I just don't think that's the right solution. But yeah, to your point, um, I think Wentz will play for sure against Cleveland if Heineke struggles this week. Yeah. Um, and it's to the point where it's like, I don't I, I, what I've said all week on the show is like, it's 55-45. I feel like Taylor is still the better option for this team for a lot of reasons so that we've discussed on many, many of these podcasts over the course of the last eight weeks. However, you, you're not nuts if you think that this like one from a curiosity standpoint, I want to know what it looks like with Wentz, like this yeah. new game plan with Brian Robinson, with Jahan healthy, with Curtis healthy, with the Terry healthy. Like I want to know what it looks like with Carson just from sheer curiosity. Mm-hmm. You also can't say, Oh, it definitely would be worse. Um, and also something, I don't know. We might just go along today. And, uh, <laughs> and I want, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out there now. This is, this is a fun off season discussion, but like I want to have a mini version of it real quick. Would it be crazy to play both? Like, to me, the fact that that playing both sounds like a, a novel, like, bonkers person idea is actually a poor reflection of the NFL, how risk-averse it is, and how uninnovative it is in so many ways, and that you are just better off doing the same thing that everyone else does, because then at least if you're wrong, you're wrong with everybody else, and mm. you won't get fired. But there are areas where it seems like Carson would be more effective, because they have, like, 
polar op. It's like you took one really good quarterback and cut mm. them in half, and the Venn diagram of their skill sets has no crossover. It's <laughs> wild when you start to think about it. So, like, some areas Carson would be better. Some areas Taylor would be better. And even if it's just like, yeah, all right, red zone, Carson, go get them. Like, there's – it seems to me like some mix of the both would actually be their best solution, um, except for that's not how quarterback works, and maybe there are other factors that – those of us that have never played and, and don't understand the rhythm it takes and, and kind of the cadence and, and all these different things, that, that that's actually a terrible idea. And there's a reason that nobody plays plays two quarterbacks. Yeah, well, I think Houston's been doing that. Right. Um, they've been doing that with so, with some very good success, actually. But I do think that in that instance, uh, Driscoll, who's the, the second kind of guy playing yeah. less next to Mills, is more of a true runner. And like Heineke is, for example. Right. So the it's almost like bringing in Taysom Hill. Like if you had Taysom Hill on the right. roster, that makes a little bit more sense because he's bringing right. And we're talking about playing two real quarterbacks, not yes. one quarterback and a gadget player. Right. And and again, like Driscoll's playing quarterback for them, but his 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 package is very like zone read centric, and he'll throw ten passes, seven passes a game, but it's a very different type of pass. So I think there is merit to that. And I think teams feel comfortable doing that because of the value add you get from a running quarterback. Here, I think you're asking a position that's really defined by rhythm and flow to to kind of chop itself up. And I mm -hmm. don't. That's why teams are always uh, reluctant to do that because um, I remember a couple of years ago they did this with Matt Leinart and Kurt Warner. Like Matt Leinart played the twenty to twenty mark, and then Kurt Warner played the red zone, and everyone's just out of sync, out of rhythm, out of speed with the game. And, you know, as being a rotational player, even playing tight end, there's a huge element of just finding your flow and finding what the opponent is doing, finding the cadence and kind of speed of the game. And it's really hard to come in on a moment's notice to play even a position like the blocking tight end is right. really challenging to do. So I can only imagine that it's really, really, really challenging for the quarterback spot. And then you're really not getting – uh, you're not doing any favors to either one of the players and you're not getting the best look in terms of evaluation of both of the players. So I'm not saying that they won't do it. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I just don't think it favors the, the guy. It doesn't favor the evaluation right. in, a, in, a, in an advantageous way. We should do off season a wacky ideas like that podcast. We just take yeah. some like super innovative, yeah. maybe even potentially stupid ideas yeah. and, uh, and dice them out. But I, it is something that I've thought about this week and the fact that it, it is such a hard immediate no, um, I think is actually a bad reflection on the NFL, even if there are legitimate reasons why the answer should be no, and there's there's a reason why the conventional wisdom is there in the first place. Take a man podcast from Odyssey Sports. I'm Craig Hoffman. That is Logan Paulson. All right, quickly, Logan, let's react to the breaking news of Chase Young that he is going to play, uh, and then we will get into a quick uh, synopsis of each of the Pro Bowl guys' seasons because they deserve that love and d deserve the shout-out on that uh young playing big deal not a big deal like for this week obviously it's a big deal in in the grand scheme we get to finally yeah. see him and, right. and and get to kind of resume the evaluation of what they do with this d line moving forward and how big of a part chase can be but in terms of the rest of this season like how big of a deal is it that he is going to play um i mean like you said in the grand scheme of commander's history and and team building it's gigantic it's good to see him back out there i think it's good that he's getting some reps this year as opposed to waiting till next year like i was kind of getting nervous that he was just going to say i'll just punt and wait till next season so for him to get some of the rust off for him to do some of the playing this year i think is is good it's good for him and especially if he's healthy and he feels right you know he had the meeting with andrews andrew said he's good everything seems good excellent let's get him out there in terms of his impact this year I don't think it's going to be anything dramatic. I would I would imagine he's going to play between 10 and 17 snaps, maybe maybe 20, probably not even that many. Um, you know, I don't know if he starts even. Like that'd be an interesting thing to kind of look at from a practice standpoint uh, this week. Yeah. But um, I, I just can't imagine him, you know, having a huge contribution after not playing for a very long time. Now, he's a physical freak. He's gigantic. He's fast. He's everything you want um, from a, like a genetic genetic potential standpoint but he hasn't played football and he, and I he think has the, here's what i would say though like i i no one will ever admit this but i think chase young watched cave on thibodeau last week and went bleep it i'm playing like there there was some part of him that just went like i can do that and it's time for me to go do it 
Mm, um, and I'm tired of hearing about how these other guys are doing a great job and like, they don't really need me. Like there's just some, cause like this was mental, um, and not, yeah. not mental in like, it was made up and like Chase is weak mentally. Like there is a, a nervous system reaction, um, a psycho neurological reaction to injury that your body protects itself. And it, it's there, there's still a lot of emerging research and science on what can break those things. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's just like, uh, you get, it's like any other fear. You just get over it. Yeah. And, and you, you know, between Dr. Andrews coming and being like, no man, your knee's fine. And him watching cave on Thibodeau. Like, I wonder if chase kind of mentally got to a breaking point where he was just like, I'm going to go try this. I'm screw it. Like I'm, I'm ready. And with that, I would say, do I expect him to have a massive consistent impact? No. Do I expect him to make some mistakes? Absolutely. But if he can make one play like Kayvon Thibodeau did last week, uh, the strip sack type of play, he could have a massive impact on this season. And that's yeah. why there's so much hullabaloo around Chase Young is he can do stuff that other dudes can't. And even if down in, down out, he may not be as good even as James Smith-Williams or Casey Tuhill or F.A. Obata because they play with a consistency and a discipline that Chase has not necessarily shown so far in his professional career his ability to make a big play if it happens at the right time um that could have an impact by the way one of his undisciplined rushes could also have a negative impact so that's the type of rope they walk uh we'll obviously talk about this more on countdown to kickoff leading into the game on saturday all right shout out terry mclaurin makes his first pro bowl um i actually i was listening to, to as i mentioned listening to kime um and i think kime made a good point like one, he's made some huge catches in big stages uh, in important games, things that have been replayed over and over. Um, he also now has the contract and was kind of the center of the NFL universe for a hot second this offseason. I think mm -hmm. that raised his profile a little bit. But it's just it's time for this dude to make a Pro Bowl. He's a Pro Bowl caliber player. He has been basically his entire career. It's a shame that he hasn't made one yet, and I'm really, really happy for one of the absolute best dudes. And I think Rivera said it well uh, when he told Terry that he made the Pro Bowl. He's like, there's a reason you're the face of our franchise. And um, – mm -hmm. Pro Bowl, Pro Bowl is is the start, I think, for Terry, and, and I think there's still upward mobility for him as a player. Yeah, I think I, he could I, be an All Pro. I, I really do. I totally agree. I think this year, to me, you know, I've, I've watched team, and like he's never, he's always been very, 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 very good. But I, you know, there was something like kind of, I don't know, like lacking in terms of my evaluation of him, and I feel like this year he kind of just said like Logan like shut up like not to me personally, <laughs> but he like answered any kind of remaining question that I had about yeah. him, his ability to consistently beat number one wide receivers kind of throughout the game flow as opposed to just near the end of games i think was pretty spectacular like the catch on uh alexander uh mm -hmm. in green bay that both those catches were amazing the catch on uh gallimore in indianapolis and gilmore yeah gilmore excuse me and all those all those kind of big plays that he's made the the momentum shifting the momentum starting stuff that he hit against new york the big slants that he catches against philadelphia like those those are big moments for a big player and he didn't shy away from it. And he, in fact, he rises up and kind of, and makes it happen for you. And I think that is, um, that to me has been the biggest difference in this year for him. And I'm sure he's done stuff like that in the past, but in meaningful games, in big games for him to make the plays that he's need to make against slay against, um, Bradbury from Philly. Like those are, yeah. those are special moments. And, uh, to elevate the play of a, kind of a subpar quarterback, you know, um, is also yeah. something that is a testament to him. Well, it also shows you how much winning matters. Like they can't, yep. you can't make big plays in, in important games if you never have important games and, uh, they've had important games. He's made big plays in them. All right. Next stop on, on our shout out city tour, John Allen, um, heart and soul of this defense <laughs> continues to just wreck games, make huge plays and, and talk about clutch plays too. Like he's made a couple of really big ones. I think Payne has probably had more clutch plays. Mm. Um, you think about the tip ball, a uh, game ceiling interception uh, in the one game, like, but Allen, certainly there's been times where like teams start, get going on them a little bit and then insert John Allen tackle for loss drive dies. Like he has done that with such consistency this year and his leadership and, and everything, I think also obviously happens behind the scenes, but from a production standpoint, like he's at the top of everything. And, mm -hmm. and that's pretty simple and straightforward in terms of why he makes the Pro Bowl. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think you say that, uh, you know, Payne has had more splash plays, and I don't disagree with that. But I do think Allen has been a little bit more consistent in terms yeah. of making plays. And yeah. uh, obviously, I think one of the things I've heard about Pro Bowls is um, – is you know you, you kind of arrive a year late and you tend to stay longer than you should and I think mm -hmm. John is kind of in that sweet spot of where he deserves to be there but he's going to stay longer he's going to get more accolade because people know him because he's done it before and he'll he'll be in there and and he he 
he definitely 1000% deserves it. Like I think this year, right. at least to my eye was better than his year last year, even though the sack totals might not be quite the same. He's just been very, very productive. So um, he, of, of the guys that deserve it on the team, he's probably the most deserving outside of maybe trust way, but you know, he's the guy you know, he's been playing so well. He went through a couple of stretches there where he was to me, probably like the third, second best guy in the NFL, just playing outstanding football. So no surprise to me there. 100% deserves it. Just yeah. And fantastic. he's someone that, you know, especially with Donald getting hurt this year and, and missing back half of the season, like John, John could wind up second team all pro. Um, yeah. I, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. You know, he really surprised if he makes first team, but it's also, I mean, who knows, depending on how he finishes, he has a couple monster games um, that's in play for him. Uh, trust way. He's definitely in, in line for an all pro uh, mm-hmm. potentially this season. Next stop on shout out city tour. Trust way. Everyone's <laughs> yeah. favorite punter. I mean, he's, He's just been so consistent, you know, and, you know, I, he came in when I was in my second or third year here and to see again, a guy who's just matured and grown and gotten better every single year and how he's added uh, clubs to his bag in terms of the directional punts and the, you know, the stuff that he does in the, um, you know, kind of in the touchback situations is, is again, like a testament to a guy who's just consistently getting better. And, um, you know, I think trust would be the first to tell you, like he benefits a lot from, some decisions they've made from a special team standpoint with Christian Holmes and Percy Butler and Ken Sims and, and Jeremy Reeves, uh, Reeves, excuse me, just covering kicks and doing a great job there. So he, he'll tell you that those guys help him out a lot, but he does a lot of special stuff as well. So, uh, I think, you know, he'd he'd be, again, be the first to tell you it's, it's a, that is a team, um, a, a team kind of award, but he is a guy that has continued to build himself up every single year. And last but not least, man, what a really cool moment. Uh, the video that the commanders put out when Ron Rivera tells Jeremy Reeves that he is the special teams starter for the NFC in the pro bowl. Of course the, the pro bowl will be uh, not actually a game this year, but um, Reeves gets that honor. Um, a guy that I actually covered, uh, but never really on the active roster. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he was back and forth on the practice squad, always occasionally would get called up fourth, fourth preseason game star for a lot of years. Um, and then he kind of like the, the, the crazy thing about Reeves is he was stuck behind a guy who was very, very similar in DeShazer Everett. Mm-hmm. Um, and now obviously uh, they, you know, DeShazer moves on in the off season following the, the terrible tragedy that, that happened with him at the end of last season. But similar, like, not quite NFL caliber to play consistently at safety, but very, very close and continuing to improve. And in the meantime, an absolute terror on special teams. And seems to be just a phenomenal guy. I, I would love to dive more into his story. You know, you, you know, Ron talks about how hey, your mama would be proud. And, you, you know, as, as Jeremy's breaking down. And so I don't know the full story there, but looking forward to, to learning more and going into his backstory. I'm sure there'll be stories written about him. Um, but just an awesome moment for a dude who's really battled and, um, by the way, deserves it. Like, phenomenal job this year from Jeremy Reeves. He's all over the place. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you know, I watch a lot of a lot of film, and he's a guy that is constantly, constantly just making plays with a relentless – pursuit to the football you know he's in a he's in an advantageous situation in the scheme here like they know he's their big dog so they put him at the five on kick coverage which is a very flexible position in terms of responsibility it's pretty much just like go to the football right as opposed you're, you're to the other. guy that they they scheme up to be free and go make tackles but that means you got to be great at it you, like you have you have to be a good tackler you have to be able to understand the angles and, and meander through blocks and shed blocks and you know all that stuff and he does it and he does a great job of that and then he's your pp on punt which again is kind of a, your third gunner. And he's a guy, he just, he plays with a tremendous physicality and a tremendous passion. And it's really cool when a guy who is, who has taken the journey that he has from a practice squad player, because having been in the league, like you know how hard it is to break a perception about yourself and go from a practice squad player to the 53 man roster. So for him just to do that is cool. And then for him in this year to kind of say, I've earned the right, you know, through outstanding special teams play, to be a pro bowler i mean holy cow like that's fantastic for him and and like i said like when you watch the film he's very deserving of it you know obviously the scheme helps him out a little bit but his his passion his pursuit his physicality is something that is i think to be admired and like there's so many times where i'm doing my breakdowns for um you know command center and i can't use special teams plays because they don't play as well in terms of review but i've wanted to use stuff that he's done because he has just been absolutely fantastic this year 
Yeah, definitely. And uh, one thing that happened for Shays uh, was he played so well on special teams year after year after year that eventually they were just like, we know you're a special teams guy, but you're so good at it. We're giving you a, a, a four special teams guy, pretty decent contract. Yeah. Jeremy Reeves, unrestricted free agent. I hope I hope his bag is next. Uh, yeah. That's a heck of a timing for Jeremy. And uh, it seems like, you know, the, the connection between him and, him and Rivera is really strong as well. So uh, hopefully that is next for him. All right, that'll do for this episode of Take Command. We'll see you at 2 o'clock on 106.7 The Fan and the Team 980 for Countdown to kick off ahead of the 49ers game. And then we'll record something after that'll come out on Monday morning. Uh, for Logan, I'm Craig. We'll see you on Take Command. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command. First, why don't, you, why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good, and then they should watch it too. And Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. We do. 106.7 The Fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do, do what Logan said. Do He's it. Very, very smart.